worries, no worries. So uh, communications is uh, all encompassing. It looks at PR, it looks at the thought leadership that you're putting out there. It's how you communicate with any of your customers, any stakeholders, including investors, including suppliers, including your employees. So it's it's the umbrella, communications is the umbrella. And then underneath that is PR, IR, investor relations. Um, even advertising and, and marketing can fall under communications sometimes, or at least there should be a dotted line or a connection between the advertising campaigns that you have and the communications that you're trying to put out there. Um, social media, of course. Uh, anything else, Glenda, that you would add? I think that's a great, great lens, Neve. I'll also say that I think there are some misconceptions around public relations too within that communications umbrella. And to Neve's point, I think comms, especially in the early days, you need to be thinking of internal communications as much as external. And then for public relations, it's so much more than media coverage. I think I think founders see hear PR and they're like, I want to be in TechCrunch, right? I want to be profiled in uh, in lights. But real public relations is about understanding all of your key external stakeholders and how their interests align with your interests. I think the best PR is actually not on the back end, getting the media coverage, but helping you make strategic decisions at the front end. So you're able to talk about things that reflect the values of your organization and you're making the right decisions to help you show up in the right way for those stakeholders whether it's investors or partners or employees and potential employees and customers. So it's actually really about thinking of audience first and your relationships with your audiences. Gotcha. So maybe the first one we'll sort of dive into is the kind of pre-launch planning, because, you know, you, you talked about sort of, um, using communications and, and public relations and, and getting that messaging and, preparing and and thinking of all the stakeholders ahead of time. So if I'm, you know, the sort of prototypical, you know, technical co-founder partnered with my business co-founder and, you know, we've got, um, you know, a duct tape together prototype that we're working on in the background, but we haven't yet, you know, shown it to the world. What are some of the things that I could or should be doing in terms of preparing this function of the company. Glenn, do you want to jump in or? Yeah, I can, I can jump in. I think some of the work that founders are doing at this stage is, is kind of natural comms work that you need to do to be able to tell your story, to convince anyone to help you build what you're building. I think the best founders are able to sell, sell a vision right? You have to inspire your team. Maybe it's your co-founder you had to inspire to join you. You have to inspire investors to invest in you. Um, and then you have to get those first customers, whether it's on the B2C side or B2B side. And to do all of that, you need a really good story and you need to have a few things really clearly defined. And that essentially is comms work. Those are things like what is your mission? What is your vision? What's your pitch, right? How do you succinctly talk about a product? I think there's this great quote, which is that like, if you can't understand something without an explanation, the person's not gonna be able to understand it with an explanation. So how do you talk about what you're building really simply? So it's relevant, believable, simple. Um, and then also I think from the outset, founders can start thinking about their brand values. Right? What do they care about? Um, what is meaningful to your company and brand? And that's going to be important both internally and eventually externally. It's really important to bake that into the DNA of the company right at the beginning. So I think those are some of the things that found, most founders are probably already thinking about by necessity in order to um, bring the people along for the ride that they're going to need to help them to succeed on the journey. Neve, what does that actually look like at this stage? Like if you were to ask a, a sort of pre-launch company some of these questions, what does that exercise look like? I mean, I'm sure if you asked any founder at this stage, hey, tell me the story of your company, mm -hmm. they would probably give this sort of chronological account of like, well, you know, I used to be working for, you know, 
Google or whatever, and and then I built this thing, and and but but that isn't necessarily actually going through a story exercise. Right. Like, how does somebody actually go about doing that? Yeah. And, and should they ask for help? Yes, absolutely. I think they absolutely should ask for help because when you're so deep in the weeds, it's hard for you to see sometimes what others are seeing and what others will care about. So there's two, it's actually interesting, there's two tracks probably that should be done at the same time here. There's the founder story, which mm -hmm. um, startup culture, tech culture loves a founder story. Still to this day, we're 10, 15 years into um, tech, NYC tech, let's say, and people just love that founder story. If there is no interesting founder story, do not make it up. <laughs> That's all I'll say. Don't lie. Don't make it up. Don't try and invent something because that will come through that you're forcing it. If a founder isn't comfortable being the face of the brand or being the face of the company or is, you know, an introverted founder, which there are many, you don't have to have a presence and you don't, it doesn't have to, the, the business story doesn't have to hang on you as an individual or you as co-founders. What you have to think about is the user and the user need and what's happening in the industry, what's happening in the world around you, and why is this moment important? Why, why now? What, what makes you special as compared to what's out there? And, and not you, the person, you, the business, you, the product. And, um, and craft a story around user needs or societal issues. And that's where media will, will want to understand what makes you special, what, why you're important now, um, how you're going to solve a certain problem. That's the stuff that people care most about. The, the founder story is just, is helpful and good to have at the same time, because it is a way to, it, it is another way to get media coverage. It's another way to get attention. If the founder story is interesting. And I think we're in a, we're in a stage in uh, society where founder stories really need to be next level interesting. They can't just be, I was in my dorm room and I, find this need or you know I was bored of my Goldman Sachs job <laughs> and I and I had a load of money that I decided to start this up you know so it has to it has to have an interesting hook and I think an important part of this too is paying attention to who your perceived competitors are and what they are doing and carve out a special niche for you or a different angle for you because that will set you apart reporters in particular and people in general don't like a same same story they like a different story they like something new and um something that makes them feel and compassionate and uh, especially actually now as well coming back to some of the stuff that you said glenda the vision the vision mission and values are the ultimate foundation with which you should be building all of your communication strategy and everything will come back to that and that will be your guiding light about how you make decisions, about how you operate, about how you communicate externally. And um, a big piece of this now for companies is what do you stand for in society as it relates to um, uh, policy issues, uh, you know, things, political issues, things like that. And how does that impact your employees and how does that impact your customers and really start thinking critically about what your, what your position will be on these things because companies have to have that position now. Um, okay, Glenda. One, one like, more thing, Charlie, just one more ahead. thing I'll add as we're, think, as we're talking about building your, your messaging pre-launch, uh, there's a great resource that I wanna point folks toward. And um, this is a framework developed by Karen Maroney. She's the former VP of global communications at Facebook. And she posted uh, this framework, I think it was on First Round Capital's blog a really long time ago. Um, so I can share that uh, with you, Charlie, if you want to share it with attendees. It's called the RIBS framework, R-I-B-S. And uh, it talks about the four things you need for a message to be compelling and stick with your audience. R is for relevant. How does it relate to what's happening in the world right now? I is inevitable. What are the tailwinds driving your story forward that make it inevitable that your startup will succeed, be as believable, which means you need the credibility to make it believable, and S is simple, which means it should be able to be really quickly understood without an explanation. And so if you can create messaging that meets that, that ribs test, it sticks to your ribs, and that's how you know you have a, kind of a really successful story going forward. 
that's awesome and super helpful. Um, at this stage of the game, I think pre-launch, it's probably unlikely that founders will put a lot of money if they, especially if they don't have it yet and they hit pre-launch to um, building out team here. But would you recommend, like, as I think about my story and, and try not to do this sort of, you know, in a bubble, who do you think the best people would be to go to, to bounce story off of? Like, should I be chatting with other founders? And, and in particular, when I, when you say my story, because we talked about stakeholders, is the story the same for everyone? Or am I coming up with like, this is my story to investors and this is going to be my story to customers. And is it, is it more stakeholder based? Do, do you want to take that, Glenda? I can go either. I have some thoughts, but maybe you can jump in if you if you want to. I will. I will say the foundational story should remain the same, um, but there's different angles for different stakeholders. The investors care about growth, revenue, TAM, total addressable market. Your competitors, um, your customers don't care about that. Your customers care about. What is it that you're doing for me that's going to help me be a better person or achieve X or do my job better, insert whatever? Like the most By the way, important... investors care about that too. Well, yes, too, true, but they, <laughs> they often care more about the growth and money. And of right. course they care about that. If, I don't, if, the, if the latter doesn't make sense to me, it's hard for me to figure out how to make money. A hundred percent. Then flip it. So customers don't care about your total addressable market. They care, they're selfish. Customers are selfish and they just want to know what you're going to do for me. Um, so, sorry. Uh, yeah, I think that the most important thing there is to figure out what the what the most important thing is for the stakeholder that you're dealing with. What do they care about most? Um, and employees care about a really great work environment and how and also a mission that is believable and a mission that is something I can get behind and that it resonates with me. Um, in terms of getting a person or getting resources to support you, I recommend looking at people in similar spaces or similar stages or, or organizations that have done this already not necessarily the same industry but the same if it's an online marketplace. How have you gone about this? And sure, talking to other founders helps, but ask them who they worked with. And especially if you've seen them getting um, speaking engagements and uh, mentions in the media that are favorable. Um, and I think, and actually those that have had to deal with crisis or reputation management issues, I think it's also helpful to talk to them because you do need to scenario plan about what are the uh, red flags that, people will have about you and your business and you should plan out that. Uh, but yeah, finding in, finding people who've worked in this industry and everybody always wants to share their thoughts and ideas. Um, and you can always hire a consultant for a few hours a week to help you with crafting your messaging or to help with pitching. Uh, at this stage, I don't think you necessarily need to be getting an agency or, um, or a hire by any means, uh, but a consultant and uh, a partner and you know, actually, Glenda, you had some thoughts on this about um, equity and things like that. Yeah, I definitely think at this stage, the consultant approach is the way to go. I don't think you need to make any investments in like a permanent headcount or an agency. There are a lot of wonderful consultants out there who have done a lot of this work. And especially at the early stage, you want someone, I think, who has experience with um, brand messaging and mm -hmm. crafting that story versus the PR and media relations side of things. You really want to nail that that story first. I've seen relationships where let's say you don't you don't have a lot in your pocket in order to pay someone their consulting fee. You can offer someone a little bit of equity who is in the space and maybe sees the potential and upside of the company. And maybe that person joins your advisory board and they become a guide by your side for the journey. Um, someone who's been around the block and kind of has that knowledge and expertise and allows you to, to tap something that you might not be able to tap, um, just kind of paying out of pocket. I've seen companies do this really, really successfully. Having someone with that comms experience on your advisory board can be really, really important. And then in terms of message testing, I would say you got to test this with your, 
with your target customers, right? If them, if the story is not resonating with them, it's not the right story for you. You can have the best story in the world, but if it's not, if it's not resonating with your target audience, it's not the right story for your business. And I think in the early days, you're probably wearing many hats. One of those hats is salesperson, right? So you should be talking with customers and seeing their reaction to these messages and to the story and taking the feedback and continuing to craft and iterate from there. Um, you know, I, I am hoping people are taking an MV, MVP approach to their, to their products. I would say, think about your story as another, as another product, right? And as you get, as you get feedback, um, continue to apply it, like apply it and iterate until you feel like you have something that's, that's really hitting the mark. One, one thing I'll, uh, put a pin in that you just said about like offering equity and consultants and stuff. I think it is really useful to get somebody who has done this before to work with you at this stage of the game. I think it'd probably be more useful for somebody to work with you on an hourly basis to workshop something similar to the way that we're sort of doing here versus going to somebody to sort of outsource the final product to basically say, hey, will you build me a brand messaging strategy or all of this sort of stuff? And which might be a big chunk of money versus saying like, hey, what's your hourly rate? Great, like, can you sit with me over a working lunch and I have some initial messaging thoughts and I would love to just, you know, sort of bounce ideas, get your perspective and all that sort of stuff. One, it may be a, a better way to manage budget. Um, but two, I don't think at this stage founders should um, let go of and outsource this process. They should get feedback from somebody who knows what they're talking about. Um, but it's it's too important to just hand off to somebody and not be like fully engaged in the process. Um, the other thing I'll say about um, equity, there are some people who um, have very uh, nice lucrative jobs running PR at Facebook and, and, and all of that sort of stuff who have no problem paying their rent, their mortgage and all of that sort of stuff who would be thrilled to help out a small company, maybe get some equity and all, and all of that sort of stuff. And I think that's the type of person, the person that you would never be able to hire, even on their hourly rate, that can make for really good advisors and equity. Um, I think on the other side, there are people who make their living as consultants, you know, need clients to pay the bills and all of that sort of stuff. And I think, you know, it's very hard for them to outside of maybe a passion project or two that they really care about where the founder really doesn't have the capital at all to take equity. And I think, you know, in general, if you're dealing with somebody who's a consultant, like expect to pay them for their time. But, you know, if somebody's making half a million dollars a year at Facebook, then maybe they don't need the money as much as they need the interestingness. So, um, you know, that that's important as well. Um, One thing on the consultant part that you just mentioned about, uh, I think it's a good idea to look at people who've done comms, PR and other larger companies, but look at their background. And I think that's critical because you may, they may have the big bold brand um, that looks great, but once you dig into it, they might only do a small piece of PR comms and they might not have the full exposure or fully understand your space or fully understand um, what it means to craft a messaging. It may have been handed to them and then they just pitch, which can be easy. <laughs> So that's why I picked you two guys out because I know you've been there early <laughs> on and all through the gamut of bigger companies, right? Because yeah, yeah, this is this is the internal sort of big company startup hire thing is that like if you are employee number 250, mm -hmm. a lot of things were in place before you got there, which is very different than early stage startup. Yeah. Um, and then on the finder, hundred percent agree. The finder actually not even, so what, what are the different stages? I think it's beta is next and seed. I would say the finder needs to be involved very much throughout that entire process. Like they are critical because they're the only ones who, who can explain to a consultant or explain to a PR person what actually makes sense. They know their business. They know their industry more than anybody else. A PR comms person has to hear them and their vision for the future throughout all of those phases. So that they're they're accurately reflecting what 
will actually happen with the company or what the CEO or the business founders are planning for. Cool. Um, I don't know if I'm going to wind up breaking this. So um, maybe we should insert a column or maybe we'll just, you know, stick it here in the, in the beta thing. Um, I actually just want to talk for a moment about launch because it is unique to PR and comms as an actual sort of stage and thing in and of itself. At least it's perceived to be. Um, everybody wants to make a big splash. So one, if I could just get both of you to sort of comment on the perceived importance of the big splash, and then maybe we can talk about sort of um, how to prepare for such a thing and, and how to make that as successful as possible. So, you know, is, for example, like, is a launch something where I, I should level up and work with a consultant or agency to organize? I think this is really, it's really going to be company specific in terms of how you think about launch. It's really a little different for B2C, for B2B. One thing I'll say to, to kick it off is that not every company sh wants, like should want or needs a big splashy company launch. And it may benefit your business actually to stay under the radar for longer for different reasons. And some of the most successful companies I've actually been a part of or consulted with are companies that are specifically delaying that PR, that big splash, because they maybe one, don't wanna give competitors a tip off to what they're doing or bigger players in the space. They don't want them to see the traction that they're getting. So they'd prefer to stay under the radar while they build a moat around the business. So I think that's really important to think about. It's like, well, what am I really gonna benefit besides the ego boost of seeing my company's name in lights? Like how is this gonna drive the business forward? And two, Sometimes it can be better to delay that big splash when you already have really strong customer advocates in your back pocket that can mm -hmm. talk about the power of the business. It's much easier to go to a reporter and say, I can put you on the phone with XYZ clients who can tell you how our company is helping their business do YZ versus like not having that track record at all. Same thing on the B2C side. If you have tons of customers who are already loving your product and you're getting a lot of traction, that's going to be more compelling. So you might want to wait until you have more of those assets built up before you do this flashy launch. That said, let's say you have a celebrity investor or you just raised a big round, something like that, then by all means, go for, go for the press push because you have the credibility because of that moment. And so I think that's how founders should think about it. It's like, do I have the assets? Do I have enough credibility to get enough traction with my story now? Or does it actually make sense for my business to focus on building the customer base and getting more traction before I go to media with my story? So you just said uh, a word that is um, a word that you guys know what it is, but maybe uh, founders might not, um, is assets. And um, what do you actually mean? Maybe we'll stick this in the tools um, area. Um, what are comms and PR assets? What are the things that I should be putting together for a launch? So there's two different types. I think there's assets that you'll share with externally, publicly, and then there's assets that you need to develop purely for internal purposes. Um, I think one of the core assets you, for internal purposes that you need to create is uh, sort of a rude, a library of rude questions that you might get. And uh, that's, it's like rude cues is the industry term, but it's basically an FA, a list of FAQs or questions and answers that you might have about your business, about you, about your uh, customer base, about the industry, about concerns, and then drafting responses to each of those potential questions so that you have one place where your key spokespeople or anybody who is going to be externally facing or answering questions knows how to speak about those things. Um, never share that document externally. Instead, refer to it in interviews or, of course, you can use it on certain customer pages and things, but um, 
yeah, that's that's one thing that I think is a big important piece um, on the external front. So the various assets, product images, uh, your logo, founder photos, headshots, and full body. <laughs> Um, ideally not against a white backdrop, ideally in some sort of atmosphere that is a little bit more interesting. Um, think about media whenever they're publishing a story, they need visual assets to tell a story. So what is it that you want to communicate to the world about you and your business and what you're offering? Um, so yeah, screenshots are fine. And that's what I've often just used or even screen grabs. So a recording of how a tool works nothing too flashy or advertising-y. It shouldn't have logos splashed everywhere. It should just, if you're doing a product demo, just record literally the product demo and don't be adding in too much animation or things like that. You can, of course, make it a bit more uh, professional looking, but it's not entirely necessary. Um, and then... Yeah, a boilerplate is something. So that's the, the absolute, that's the master description of the company. And that should be the, what you put at the bottom of a press release. And it's your go-to that you're always, if somebody asks, you know, what does the company do? And, and it's written format, then you, you send them that, which is a brief description uh, about what it is. Gotcha. I'll um, add a, a few things to, to that list. So I think in addition to kind of like these these like uh, hard assets that you need in order to communicate your story to media. Does your building the story thinking about your customer advocate list? So having customers at the ready who are willing to speak with reporters or provide a quote. Uh, and another one is data. What data can you share about the traction you're seeing, the demand? Um, that's the effect on the customer yeah. savings, ROI. That exactly. Kind of and that, that data is so important to breaking through the noise. I think if you have a great story, customers at the go and really compelling data, you have what you need to go to, to media. So I would say like, those are, those are three of the, of the really big things. And then I also say, if you don't have your own proprietary data, at least going to pull third-party data that backs up the story. Uh, can be really important. Oh, there's Mirren. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, mom needs another hand for a few minutes. So you're going to behave? Okay. Um, so let's talk about team here for a moment, right? Um, should I engage someone to help organize a launch if I am doing, you know, some kind of a Ta-da moment. And you know, how do I how do I pick that person out? It's such a hard question without knowing the industry, without knowing the product. Like I think you mentioned. Well, well, let's, take, let's take two basic ones, right? Yeah. Um, we'll we'll take the two opposing. Like one is, you know, consumer product looking for a mass market audience, and one is, you know, sort of niche enterprise tool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, I think for the consumer product, having never worked on one, but I will say, <laughs> I will say that press boxes and more, uh, the more flashy event and advertising dollars is where um, I see a lot of work being put in uh, to try and gain traction in a public, in public forums. On the B to B front, there's a lot that you can do uh, with just direct LinkedIn outreach for launch and targeted emails um, and, you know, dinners and, well, it depends on this environment they're in or hosting webinars or hosting, uh, speaking at events and things like that, sponsorships and partnerships. Um, but yeah, so if you're, let's say, a Sweet Green or a Parachute, I'm sure they hired an agency early on to help with their big launch parties and to help with their um, branding and look and feel and advertising. Um, I think I imagine that is the case, but Glenda, I would love to hear your perspective on this. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're, if the goal is to orchestrate a big launch and you absolutely need a professional working with you, whether that's a free, like a PR freelancer mm -hmm. or, or a small agency. And again, I mean, it depends it depends what your resources and budget are like. It depends what your round is, how you're capitalized, right? Will 
impact what you're able to invest in. Um, but I will say at a minimum, you, you do want a PR professional advising you at this stage if you're going after big media. But that can be, as Charlie said, as, as small as like investing even a few hours. Mm-hmm. I will say like very like early in my career, I advised, I advised pre-seed startups on launch strategy um, for very little and kind of like taught founders how to fish and was like, here's a media list here are your targets. This is what I would recommend. Here's how to write a pitch, like email me if you need me and got them their first big hit and then help and they, and showed them kind of how to do it from there. And they were, they were bootstrapped. Right. And that was actually really successful. We got like a New York times hit and it really snowballed. And so that can work, but I think you need, you need someone who knows how to, to do it, helping you. I would not recommend you try to do uh, a launch or like, you know, w- without at least talking to someone in the PR space who's done it before. I have to say it's pretty amazing that you got a New York Times hit. That's very unusual. And don't let that be your benchmark. <laughs> <laughs> it was, a, it was, it was when New York Times still had blogs. This was, this was a while ago. Love it. But trade media is also for the B2B world, especially, I think trade media, as we were talking about this uh, the other day, Glenda, about how powerful trade media can be to actually reach your target audience and Um, spending your time on where you think your target audience is actually spending their time as opposed to, and and being conscious of noise and, and the um, ephemerality of certain social media, just, it's not a one hit wonder situation. It's just a constant strategy of hammering the social media world and uh, the media world over time. And that's when your message will really land. Um, I would say product hunt is a great place as well for certain online software based uh, product and tools. Um, But when it comes to launch day, really orchestrating things like planning is critical and making sure that you allow at least three to four weeks to actually do media outreach so that you can do you have time to do product demos. Um, You're paying attention to what's happening in the news and you're not seen as being tone deaf that hey, everybody's focused on what's happening in Ukraine or everybody's focused on what, what's happening in at the Capitol. That's not the day to be pitching a reporter because if if your team's mental health isn't doing well, then you can bet your bottom dollar that the reporter's mental health isn't doing great either and their readers isn't either. So that's not what they, they're not caring about your blockchain <laughs> technology at the moment. Um, they're, they're caring about humanity. So orchestrating things around um timing and uh making sure that you have all your messaging prepared for media outreach for social media for product hunt and then cascading things from there so let the media go first then if you wanted to put out a press release you could do that press releases are a formality for startups at this stage it's not really entirely necessary the media head is more important than a press release at this stage um, and making sure that your social media times well with it, that your team has social media to share on their platforms, that you can use your customer base as well. Uh, sending an email to your customers about launch is critical, of course. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's many more things I'm not even talking about. I have, I have a few things, things, a couple things to add. One is that I, I will just encourage people to like make sure they have product market fit before they do the launch. I've also sure. seen founders get that tech crunch hit, but like then realize that like, oh no, we don't want to pursue this business model. Actually, we're changing everything. And then you've lost the opportunity. You know, you can't, you don't You're not going to get another tech crunch hit on a pivot. Yeah. yeah. So so you really you really want to choose the moment carefully and be ready. I also I want to talk a little bit about newsworthiness and like mm-hmm. picking a newsworthy moment. I think for startups, funding rounds provide these baked in moments for bigger storytelling. And that's because you have the credibility of your investors backing you. And that gives you the credibility with the media to tell the story. And when you are closing a round, you're going to have to file a form D that is public. So also know that and know that timing and that you're going to have to time your announcement around when you file. Um, I feel like that's something that a lot of founders don't know and get in a lot of trouble with. And they're like, oh, oops, this is out already. So what one that's one good thing uh, to be aware of uh, as well. 
the, the point that was made about timing and just making sure that you have enough time to do demos in three or four weeks, I've definitely seen that where you, you pitch a reporter, they're actually quite interested, but they're busy for the next week. And then they're on vacation for the week after and they can't get to you to test or try the product for another couple of weeks. Or sometimes people just don't leave enough time where they literally finish the product this week and expect to tell the world next week. And so they have nothing showable to press and media beforehand. So I think the, you know, uh, leaving yourself enough time to get it in the hands of, of even not just press, but, you know, we talked about customers, right? Is that um, influencer customers or, or, or other folks who can comment about something you want them to be using it for a little while to be able to speak to like, yes, this thing is uh, helpful for me. So that needs to be in the timeline uh, as well. Um, the one other tool I would suggest, and I, I tell us to all my founders, whether you like Twitter or find it to be a you know depressing hellscape, every single person you would want talking about your business is there. It is for better or worse, the industry water cooler. And most people even occasionally check their new followers. And, you know, I've seen time and time again, founders pitching reporters that they don't follow. Um, and, you know, I, I think you should think about your own Twitter profile as a conversion mechanism. Right, where you sort of say, hey, um, my last month's worth of tweets has been interesting things about the industry or retweets of customer buzz uh, or, or, or kudos or what have you, or that Medium post that I wrote about how things are changing or some data or whatever, because you follow a reporter, they look at your bio, they click through to the site, it's in their coverage area, a, if they follow you back, you're in because you could always DM somebody that is following you back and, and the hit rate is probably a lot better than it is by email. Um, but at least, um, you know, when you do send that email, they may have seen your site. Um, they may have noticed you before and, and, and they, they match the name and the, they see that you're uh, kind of out there. So I don't necessarily think every founder is going to create you know, an influencer strategy for themselves. But, um, you know, I, I do think it could be a useful tool for outreach. Yeah. Uh, not cold DMs though. I mean, you want to DM people that are following you back. I have some thoughts on this. Go, go ahead, jump in. I 100% agree with you to a certain extent. Okay. You can't force a founder to be, so, to be socially savvy. If right. They're not because if if they then just start doing this purely to get media coverage people can see right through that and then mm -hmm. they become this megaphone broadcaster um so i would just be very careful if absolutely i agree with you that that's where the media are they pay attention to who's following them they pay attention to what people are saying and who's replying to them but you also don't want to be desperate and i think that there is a way for Founders who don't necessarily want to be, who are the introverted ones, or not necessarily the ones who, um, where it naturally comes to them to be a thought leader, or to have certain opinions about the industry, that's fine. Um, being genuine and reading the reporters' articles and um, giving context around what they're doing in the broader space of the environment or or society is what the reporter cares about. And actually, back to Glenda's point about research fine if you don't have research but pull research that's publicly available and say hey here's what we're seeing in the industry and as of 2022 have you noticed that x percent of um, students are experiencing this or x percent of educators are experiencing this and you insert the context for why they should care about what you're doing and say and that's why we're doing this <laughs> and so they I, I just i would just caution on the whole 
forcing social um, thing, but it is a powerful place to see the reporter always check their social, check what their mindset is that day. You get so much information and also know that whatever you send to a reporter has the potential to always be public. So there is a chance that actually your email or whatever you say to them over email will land up on their Twitter and they may laugh about whatever it is that you've sent to them. So be careful and um, uh Empathetic. Now that you put the fear of God into everybody pitching. Yeah. Just be, be, and you can always say on background or, you know, uh, I'd love to share some news with you under embargo um, or off the record. Like you can say things like that, but also like don't always say it. <laughs> right. No, and I, I agree. And even somebody who, who gets pitches from, uh, occasionally I wind up on tech influencer blogger lists or whatever so i'm on the receiving end of a lot of pitches yeah yeah and i obsessively post about the fact that i have a kid and mm -hmm. um and it just really strikes me when somebody sort of reaches out with could be a parenting thing mm -hmm. and doesn't acknowledge that i now have a new kid like it was very clear that i just got the same thing that everybody else did yes, yes, yes. and for that <clears throat> two seconds of extra research um to to comment i think it is you it really turns up your your hit rate mm -hmm. um, yeah I, I think a, a couple of things so like one on the tools front i think especially if you're if you're going out for a launch and like media coverage is part of your strategy you're going to want a social and media monitoring tool so mm -hmm. you want to be listening to what people uh, across social media and what reporters are saying about your business and also your competitors. My favorite, like really light touch tool is met called mention.com. There's like, I think it's like a hundred dollars a month and you can follow everything for your business. And like, I think like, I, like three or four other terms, like maybe your major competitors and it pulls in everything from like across the web. So media mention.com mention.com. I mean, it, there's an app. I, our, can we have much more robust tools? Obviously we're a public company, but I still use mention. I will not give it up because it is so user-friendly. And I think as a founder, you want to have your finger on the pulse of what's happening in the industry, what the conversations are. You know, you are that person for your, your company. So I really strongly recommend that if for some reason you can't invest in something like that, at least set up your Google alerts. It's probably something that should be done pre-launch, you can set up Google alerts. You get pushed into your inbox. If anyone is talking about your company or maybe keywords in your industry that you want to know about. So I, I will say that that's important. And then, you know, I know we were talking a little bit about you know, slipping into our reporter DMs or like sending cold pitches and like not acknowledging that there's a human on the other end. And so like, like, that's what I will remind everyone is that Journalists are, are human beings, uh, just like you and me. They have lives, they have children, they have interests and hobbies, and they're more likely to want to talk to you if you find some commonality and acknowledge their humanity. And so I think a lot of it starts with relationship building before you are pitching them on a story, maybe reaching out to them like, hey, I saw you wrote about this. That's so interesting. Like I'm working on something in this space, would love to share a little bit about it if you're interested in grabbing a cup of coffee and not pitching them on covering, but really building a relationship for the future. Um, I will say those are really good investments to make early on. Um, and, you know, it sets you up for success when you do have that news, newsworthy moment, maybe down the line when they could be ready to write something, you already have that, that relationship developed there. Gotcha. So I want to jump into the next stage um, and, and, and move this forward. When should I think about hiring full-time for somebody on the, and, and actually I put this in the context of like, you guys both mentioned earlier that there are many aspects to sort of the PR and communications side, and it is sort of bleeding into other things as well. So for example, like the PR strategy of Andreessen Horowitz is to be a media company at the same time. And then I don't know whether those, you know, content creation people are 
under comms or under marketing or, or, or how that works. But, um, you know, at what point do you think it's time for a company to start thinking about a, a full-time PR comms person in-house? Yeah, so I, I would say that like when I think about my, at least my experience across the industry, I think around like series A is when you'll want like that, that manager, PR manager level person in house. And that might be the same person running your social media as well, depending on what your resourcing is like. Um, and maybe that, maybe that grows into an additional person who's focusing on content. I think it, it, B2B and B2C is also really different here. I think content and thought leadership are really important in the B2B space. So you're going to want to make those investments early. Uh, you know, currently, you know, on my team, I'm overseeing public relations, social media, and editorial, and it includes a little bit of paid social. And so you get this integrated approach of all your channels working together. I think it's like the early stages, you might have one person who's wearing a lot of, a lot of hats, so maybe doing a few of those things. And then I think by series B, most companies are really entering this growth stage where they need a more sophisticated comms and PR leader. So maybe at Series B, you're hiring that director of comms and PR who has the PR manager beneath them. That director of comms is probably also doing internal comms for you. At that point, you might have like a social media specialist on the team. And then if you're B2B, you're, you're hopefully making some content investments too, whether that's in-house or maybe just getting external freelancers or copywriting chef to help develop some of that thought leadership content, whether that's, you know, on your blog or white papers, et cetera. So, so maybe the way that we'll lay this out is in the flywheel building stage, particularly for B2B, we'll put some, you know, uh, maybe consulting uh, for uh thought leadership, industry content, um, and, uh, you know, just some early, you know, kind of pieces, maybe not full time. Mm -hmm. Um, and then in the early scaling phase with some, some, somewhere between flywheel building and early scaring is the series a is this, um, manager level person. Um, and the manager level person, you know, also will be managing whoever's doing your social and, and, and all of that sort of stuff. They might be one and the same person. Yeah, I, there's, a, there's also exceptions to this, obviously. Um, one thing to note is that there's, there are those businesses out there that don't do fundraising. Um, and have been bootstrapped and are profitable from day one. And so for them, it's not it's less about what series funding and more about like the scale of, of, of revenue and the scale of their team, I think is a big one too. Because if you have a 400 person team, but you might not have a ton, you're not profitable yet, you might not have funding, um, but you're bootstrapped, you have a lot of people that you need to communicate to. Um, so that there's just some nuances there around communications and making sure that you find somebody who has done both internal and external will be critical, especially now more than ever. I've just hired some people for internal comms and our company is like 300 people, but um, we have a lot of needs and we have a lot of different businesses that were, we have five different brands in the company. And um, there's, there's a lot to be said. And when I was going through that interview process for that internal comms person, um, the, the demand for internal comms right now is so high because like I said earlier on, everything that's internal is external and um, knowing what the company stands for and all the stuff that's going on in the world, companies are expected to have a position on certain things and you you need people to help you figure out that process and, and what you're going to be saying to your team that then can become more external. So I would just say that you definitely want to hire somebody at the early scaling stage exactly that you have here who has both internal and external experience at that point. And then at growth scale, I, I definitely, I, I up until the last year or two years ago, I probably wouldn't have said this, but I think not only a director of comms, but a dedicated internal comms person is critical. Gotcha. Um, 
how much of um, communications, customer communications, and customer success fits, like when do those things start to fit into each other? Because if I think about um, the ways in which the company talks about itself, sometimes it's to people who aren't customers yet, and other times it's to people who are customers. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering where the, the marketing drip, the, uh, where does PR and comms end and marketing begin? I think it's such, it's such a great question, Charlie. And I think it's, it's actually really different depending on the company and the goals. Um, you know, I, I think comms at its best is a strategic function laddering into the CEO. I think reputation goes well beyond, you know, lead gen and customer mm -hmm. awareness. You know, great comms and PR is kind of greasing the wheels of your entire business. It means it's easier to hire employees. It's easier to get investors. It's easier to do the sales calls because people have heard of your company and, and there's goodwill there. And so I, I think you should you need to think about it broader than marketing to kind of have the full power. That said, like PR specifically can sometimes be an important marketing channel, but that's a really different strategy. If the strategy is media coverage that leads to customer acquisition, that's really, really different than building kind of the broader reputation, let's say, of, of your business. So it can interact in different ways. Um, and that, that'll affect where you have the function reporting up in the org. So if it is more, more lead gen, you might have it laddering up to a CMO. If you care more about building, promoting, protecting brand reputation, you might have it ladder up to the CEO or a chief strategy officer. Um, either way, I do think marketing and comms need to be really aligned. Should be, uh, again, going back to the beginning of this conversation on mission, vision, values. You know, that's the same across marketing and comms. One thing I, I will say um, that I think people don't realize is that marketing copy is very different than, than comms, than writing for, for comms. And in communications, it's usually more about educating your audience in a really like human way versus selling the, ben the product benefits to them. And if you try to like, if, if you try to like do the slick marketing copy in comms channels, it's, it's not gonna go over as well. So they are really actually very, very different in their approaches in, in that way. I would also add that... just, you mentioned something about thought leadership, Charlie, um, uh, a few minutes ago. And I think thought leadership also takes different forms. So there's thought leadership in the context of comms and then thought leadership that is more like content marketing. And so um, content marketing, I think, fits squarely in marketing, but should, I similar to what Glenda just said, should be very aligned with the comm strategy. And um, they're having a dotted line between SEO, content marketing, and comms is really important. Um, and I think the power of content that you can uh, get certain messages out there or answer certain questions that you think people are searching for, that that is going to be leaps and bounds more impactful than the media hits that you might be getting because it answers questions that people are actively searching all the time. And media hits and social media is so fluid and ever changing and there's less control or less um, impact often from those. So thought leadership in the context of comms, I would think about op-eds and bylines. Um, there's certain publications that allow you to be a contributor, though they don't, people can sort of see through those now as being pure marketing. Um, so just be thoughtful about that. There's certain publications that accept opinion pieces, so op-eds or bylines, and uh, they can be powerful and probably would be a step up because there is somebody actually paying you know, reviewing those, whereas contributed pieces aren't typically as carefully reviewed. 
And then um, speaking engagements, of course. And, and if you're somebody who's very socially active online, Substack and Medium are super powerful too. It just depends on the character you are and the presence that you have online and the following that you have. Um, yeah. Uh, speaking engagements is sort of a really interesting thing, especially around like conferences, podcasts, all of that sort of stuff. It's, it is um, supporting the visibility of the founder. Um, how early is it worthwhile to, to get a founder out and about and, and maybe even put somebody on, you know, pitching for that founder as opposed to the company? I think it, I think it's again, like company specific. I think it depends how integral the founder story and that founder voice is to the overarching company yeah. story. Um, you know, as one example, you can think of is it a company, which is, you know, an, uh, HR technology company and the company itself had a really great reputation for being a best place to work. And the founder had helped build that culture from the ground up. So by promoting the founder story and how to build a great com company culture from you know, seed to scale, we were able to also reach our target audience. And so the two stories laddered into each other. You, you might have a founder that, you know, there is not something organic like that there, or maybe that founder doesn't like to be on stage. That's not, that's not their strong suit. And that's okay too. I think it goes back to what Neve said about social. I think it's, it really is about finding the, the authentic points of connection and leaning in to what, what makes your company unique and it might not be that founder story. So I think it, I think it really depends on, um, on, on each company. Gotcha. Um, so we're obviously not going to get to this whole thing, but we, we, we got a lot of um, really important stuff here. Um, I, I want to pause on our, our worksheet for a moment to ask a little bit about hiring in this space, whether it is for consultants, for uh, things that look more like agencies or shops and, and full-time. Um, what are some of the keys to vetting? Like as, as, as you guys make hires in your organizations, how do you tell you know, who can make a useful contribution versus, you know, uh, versus not? What are your sort of key vetting points? Media coverage is one <laughs> one piece that's super important. Uh, seeing that that means of relationships, you don't have to actually. I I don't maybe Glenn, do you have a different opinion? But I don't think you have to actually have a relationship with a reporter or any reporters to have to be able to secure media. You have to have a good story. You have to have a good angle, uh, really compelling subject line. Somebody who can write well is critical to this role. Somebody who understands what it means to persuade and to be timely with a message and uh and then can help coach the team to be able to the, to continue to carry that message through so there's different phases there's the pitch and that's you selling whatever it is angle story that you're trying to get through and then it's whether the story ends up turning out the way you want it to be do, do your key messages pull through into the story does your spokesperson get a really tight, neat, beautiful quote um, that just really hits the nail on the head that you're trying to get across to people. Um, yeah, I think that I, I really look at media coverage and what they've been able to secure. And then just, you know, the press releases that they've written or the op-eds that they've written. It's tricky there though, because often press releases and op-eds, by the way, is not just one person. It's usually, it can be up to 10 people who get involved in a piece and whether it's the finder and the CMO, and then maybe an investor who happens to be really strong with PR or comms gets involved and maybe another advisor. And so there's always like classic Google Doc situation where suggestions and comments are being made. So it's harder to judge a, a comms person's writing ability from the press release and the, um, the sample pieces that they send you because it isn't always just them. 
So sometimes and oftentimes recently, I've noticed there's a lot of exercises that people get in their interview process to ask them how they would, might write a pitch and who would they go to. So having the sensibility to um, show that this is who I went to and, and I think that they're the right person for that story because this is the stories that they've been cover, covering recently, that shows that they'll do their research as well. Um, testing and, and checking for curiosity and uh, whether they're really digging deep into the depths of the internet to find out who a person is at a publication or who a person is at a podcast is really important too. I, I think that's all absolutely right, Neve. I think the, the one thing that I'll add, I think especially as you're looking for your, your like first comms and PR hires, especially that first like direct director level, I think founder like head of comms chemistry is really, really important. I think you need to have a very high level of trust both ways. This is the person you want to be able to tell you if you're doing a bad job in an interview, if you're not hitting the messages, if you need work, or if you get up on a stage and you need more practice, you need someone who's going to be able to tell you that, and you're going to be able to hear that from, and that's, and that's hard. You know, I think that there's a, a lot of high, like, the stakes are really high. You put a lot into it. You need someone who's going to be really honest with you in that way. And you also need someone who you can trust to, to tell them like where all the skeletons are in the closet. Like where are the chinks in the armor of the company? Where are the weak spots? So they can look out for that when they're telling your company story and also help repair those chinks in, in specific ways. Um, you know, it's, it's like a consigliere, right? You need someone who's going to be your strategic storytelling partner. Um, and so I'll say if you, if you're not feeling that chemistry, if you're not feeling that trust off the bat, that person is not the right fit for you, even if they have the most incredible experience and are the best writer. Um, so I, I think that's probably my, my number one advice for those early hires. Gotcha. Well, you guys don't need any more work and you've done a great job in, in, in this interview and, and panel. So um, I'll be your, your consigliere for that and, and being totally straightforward and, and, and honest. Um, I really thank you both so much for uh, spending time with us, uh, sharing your knowledge. We're going to go back and review everything that you said, try and catch up, try and fill this document up as much as possible and, and package it up as uh, in addition to the recording. Um, really, really appreciate your time and um, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. So long.